Okay, so I think uh, the rest of the people log on when they log on, but it's good, you know, we're, we're back to Thursday nights, all your smiling faces on the screen or pictures or, or letters of names, but all with us together here on Pesach on Chol Moed. And uh, I know we're all busy already cooking and preparing for the second days of Yuntif. So uh, the fact that we're all here in some capacity or another is very special that we're, we're keeping the consistency in our Limud as we go through the, uh, the second parak, the second chapter of Makos. I'm just going to mute where the noise is coming from. Uh, nothing personal. Oh, my muting power did not actually work for some reason. Okay. Uh, everyone, if you, if you have noise in your background, just mute yourselves. I'm not sure why I can't mute. Okay. So we actually, we left off on the top of Ches Amut Aleph. We left on the top of 8A. Okay. On the top of Ches Amud Aleph, 8A. And the Gemara were basically were four lines from the top of the page. And the Gemara is going to give us a case that is important for us to just review very briefly what the machlokis, what the dispute was in the Mishnah on Zion Amid Beis, in the page prior. So what we learned last time was that in the Mishnah on Zion Amid Beis, it said that there is a machlokis, a dispute between the rabbis and between Rebbe, how we determine the case of the Torah. The Torah tells us the case of someone who kills Bishoge, someone who kills another person inadvertently. It wasn't an ones, you know, he could have made some extra preparations, he could have been a little bit more mindful, but it definitely wasn't deliberate murder and it wasn't complete negligence on his part. So he said, what is the paradigmatic case of the Torah? According to majority opinion, it's there's two lumberjacks, they go into the forest. One lumberjack, he takes a swing with his axe, but then the metal part of the axe, the blade detaches and then flies off and embeds itself in Shimon's head. So that's the case of inadvertently killing someone in the Torah that sends someone into exile. They don't get put to death, they go to exile. The second interpretation of that verse in the Torah was Rebbe. Rebbe's position is that actually what happens is that the lumberjack, he takes a swing at the tree, right? Zadie, last time you're telling us, you go side by side, side by side, you make the V. So at one time he takes the swing and then a splinter, like a piece of shrapnel, a splinter from the tree comes off, shoots off it at a high velocity. And that piece of wood from the tree embeds itself into Shimon, into the other lumberjack. And that's what sends the person to Gullus. Rebbe's case is a little bit more of a chiddush. It's a little bit more of a novel explanation because it's less direct. Uh, because think about it. When I swing my axe and the metal detaches and hits someone, that's a direct action. Rebbe is taking an extra step. Rebbe's telling me that if the lumberjack, he hits the tree and then a piece of the tree comes off and hits somebody, that also will make someone liable and culpable to the extent that he is sent into exile to atone for his sin. Why do we need a notice introduction? Because the Gemara on the, on the top of Chesem and Aleph, four lines from the, uh, from the top, addresses this point. Amar Papa. Rapapa posed a scenario. Man deshoda pisa ledikla, someone who throws a clump of dirt at a palm tree, Va'asar tamri, and then some of the dates detached as a result. Va'asal tamri v'katol, and the dates come off and they hit somebody and kill him. Uh, I'm not really sure, you know, you, you know, dates are, they're not the most lethal objects, so it had to have been at a, a particular angle, at a particular velocity. This comes to Machlokis, the Rebbe and Rabban. The Rabbanan, they would say, I'm not culpable because that's an indirect action. I didn't throw the dates at somebody. I threw something at a tree, and it happened that the dates detached themselves from a tree and hit someone. It's a grumma of sorts. Whereas, according to Rebbe, this is analogous to the case of the Mishnah, the case of the Torah, where I hit the tree and a splinter of wood shoots out and hits Shimon. This is analogous to that case, and Rebbe would say you're chayev. The Rabbi asks, though, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, if I could just finish this, this, uh, this thought, I'll take questions after this piece. The Gemara asks, Pshita, what do you mean? This is such an easy analogy. Why did Rabbi Papa have to teach it to us, right? And it's a, you know, 
obviously, you know, you don't always want to say what's obvious to one person is not obvious to the next, but it was obvious at least to the Amorayim and the Gemara. So, Matatema Koa Koho Dami, Kamash no. I would have thought that maybe we've even Rebbe would concede that this is a case of Koach Koho. What's Koach Koho? Koach, Koach means strength. So, my strength, when I you know, hit the tree and the wood comes down, hits someone. Rebbe says that is viewed as a direct action on your part. It's not two separate. It's not you hit the tree and then the wood just happens to come out and hit somebody. No, you're high for that. But I would have thought to say maybe, according to Rebbe, it's not analogous that if I throw something at a tree and then dates happen to detach and hit somebody, maybe that's one step too much removed that I wouldn't be liable um, for killing that person to the extent that I'd be sent into exile. Kamash Malan comes along to Gemara to tell us, you, according to Rebbe, it's analogous, it's similar enough, and you're held accountable. Now, one last little piece just to get to the Mishnah, and then I'll pause for questions. So if that's not Koach Koho, what in theory, according to Rebbe, Rebbe's the one with the very broad interpretation of what's considered a direct action, of what we could trace back to as your action, your deed. What was a case where Rebbe would draw the line and say, there are just so many steps removed, we can't call this a direct act of murder on, or manslaughter on your part. So the Gemara gives us an example, a, convolute, a sort of convoluted case to prove the point. Where do we have a case of koach koho, the force of your force um, that is not attributed to your direct action? So you throw a clump of dirt and then it hits a bunch of branches. And then these branches, right? Step one, throw the clump at the branches. Then the branches detach and hit. Step two, they hit the dates. And then the the dates detach as a result. the And then the dates hit somebody and kill them. Rebbe would say at that point, we can't attribute that as a direct action on your part. It's two steps removed. Because I only detach the branch. I caused the branch to dislodge from the tree. The branch went ahead and caused the dates to dislodge from the tree, which thereby killed Shimon. Oh my God. So since it's because it's two steps removed, we call that koach koho. That's not attributed to me directly. And therefore, I would not be sent to Gullis as a result. Do I have to do some chuva for it? Maybe, maybe not. We can talk about it closer to Yom Kippur. But that is a case so far removed that everybody would agree. Even Rebbe would concede that you're not to go to Gullis. You're not obligated to go into exile for such an accidental deed. I don't okay. agree. You would agree, Zadie? Okay, no. you're, in good, you're in good company with all the Amorayim. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but when you cause a branch to detach, you know it's going to hit something underneath it. And there, there are dates hanging on, on a branch underneath it. Uh, it's going to, with its force, it's either going to knock that other branch down or it's going to knock the dates off the branch. There's a good chance of all that happening. Then we come to the situation of Shimon who gets hit by a splinter of wood. I don't see any liability there at all. Uh, everybody knows, especially lumberjacks who are in the business, that when you chop a tree down, splinters of wood are going to go flying. What is he standing so close for? Mm -hmm. that it's, it's a normal thing. You chop wood and splinters are going to fly. Right. So I think this is a, a little bit, you know, not these aren't just shavings of wood that are coming off. You'll forgive me if I don't have the precise terminology down pat. But this is a little less common for a splinter of wood a big splinter of wood that shoots out at such a high speed to kill somebody. But like you said, it's not the most um, unlikely thing either. So I like, I like what you're pointing out, you know, until this point, we've always viewed Ruvain, the, um, 
I guess the murderer, for lack of a better term. We, uh, murder is a strong term. The person who commit manslaughter. So we always view him as the active party, and we view Shimon, the victim, as the passive party. But Zadie, I like what you're pointing out, which is maybe Shimon has some responsibility to make sure that he is not too close to uh, his fellow lumberjack. He could have taken some precautions as well. So um, that's certainly a good point. I don't see the Gemara doesn't raise that over here, at least. But uh, your point's well taken on that. Certainly, if Shimon um, didn't practice basic uh, social distancing uh, that is common <laughs> in that profession, then um, you know possibly Ruben would not be liable if uh, he didn't maintain the industry standards. Phyllis, I think you had a question before, right? Yeah, I did. And then afterwards, I started thinking. This reminds me of Chad Gadja in a way. <laughs> right. Then this thing hit that thing, which hit that thing. Ah, yeah. There's a connection to Pesach. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, I don't know anything about legal issues, but it's, is, is it like like somebody would say, I mean, I don't know what, what again, what the legality is, but like, um, um, oh, what do you call it? Uh, now I can't remember. Uh, like, um, it's not it's not murder, but it's... it's um, yeah, I think oh, manslaughter is a term, right? Huh? Yeah, man. But what comes yeah. after that? Uh, uh, negligence, yeah, homicide. Yeah, yeah. Negligence, negligence, homicide. No, no, no. There's another. The uh, stage, Jeremy's term. The uh, one uh, stage one, stage two. Say, why can't I think of first the degree, second, second degree? Yeah, 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 yeah. Degree, right? Like, like first degree, second degree, or third degree. It sounds like that's what. what it's, the a, it's a similar is. notion. I, th I think in every legal. I mean, again, I'm not an expert myself. But I imagine every legal system has different categories for distinguishing different levels of killing someone based on yeah. intent and the, and the circumstances. So we're learning the, the Gemara's categories of that, but I, I like the analogy yeah. that you're drawing. Okay, anyway, that was- Yeah, I think the language today. that she's talking about is, is uh, being negligent uh, versus like recklessness versus intentional. Right, negligence yeah, versus recklessness are. versus intentional. Okay, so I think, you know, what- Well, what it's not intentional, we know that. It's got right. it's the But best. there is something, you know, what Jenny's pointing out, the term negligence, we have something which is called shia, negligence, which is karov lemezid, which if you're so negligent that it's yeah. just like, you know, like half a step away from being deliberate. Um, so we talked about that last time. The Me'iri said that you won't get capital punishment, but because it's worse than a typical case of inadvertently killing someone of Shogi, you don't get the protections of the city of refuge. So you could go into exile, but the Goli Hadam, the relatives can still come and, uh, and kill you nonetheless. So that's that middle stage over there. Okay, anyway, this is actually the Gemara that I hope to finish last time. So you forgive me, I think we, we got to move on to the Mishnah for today. So the Mishnah continues in this topic, unless there's something, again, that's very unclear that I could just clarify. Was anything unclear from the last piece that I can address? Rabbi, what page are you starting now? We are in Chesam and Av on 8a, and we are now at the Mishnah toward the top of the page. Okay. okay. Um, I'm not sure in art scroll it's to the first power or second power, but uh, you should see where the Mishnah is. That should be easy to find. Yeah. Okay. We're going to talk about other permutations, other cases of gullus, of deeds that someone commits that would send him into exile, meaning killing the shogeg. Okay, so again, I, I might not translate this so frequently because it's replete throughout the Gemara. That is our topic. Killing the shogeg, the shogeg means inadvertent murder. Okay, so it's not something that's out of my control. It's something I could have been a little more careful about, but it's not deliberate either. That's what killing the shogeg is. And then gullus is going into exile. Like, we're in Gullus right now. Okay. So someone throws a stone into a Shusarabim, into a public area. Uh, imagine, right? You just, uh, you're going through the Great A Beldati's parking lot. You come by your car, and he's like, chuck a stone into the parking lot, and bam, it hits somebody in there, right? Good chances. Areza Gola, you'll be sent to Gullus. You'll be sent into exile. Now, why only exile? Why not, uh, why is it not worse than that? We'll talk about that in the Gemara. Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov Omer, Imesha Yatsa Ha Evan Miyato, Hotsi Halas Rosha Vikipla Hareza Pater. 
So I was just talking to Marissa today and I was saying, you know, I need a better hobby than just playing uh, Call of Duty video games on my phone. So I was, I was trying to think of like a good, like active sport to do. So I was looking at videos of knife throwing on, uh, on YouTube and uh, Marissa said, absolutely not. I was like, I don't know, you know, you need it for self-defense. And they sounded, I was trying to like make up all the reasons in the book of why it was okay. Um, Lamai said we need a backyard first in order to do that. So it's a moot point. But imagine, right? Imagine, um, God forbid this should ever happen, but I'm doing knife throwing and um, or axe throwing. That's a popular thing these days. You go axe throwing. So I throw the axe. No one's there. Fully clear path. It's heading straight into the bullseye of the target. And then someone just, you know, almost like in a sitcom kind of way, sticks out his head. It's like, oh, hey, what are you doing over there? And then, bam, slices his head clean off. Forgive me for the, for the imagery, but I think it, it helps. Um, so what happened was, originally, I threw the axe. It was not going to kill anyone. I did not commit a Misa Ariga. That was not a murderous action. But then Shimon, once the axe was in midair, he sticks his head out, and then the axe hits him as a result. I do not go to Gullis. I am exempt. Uh, and it's, it's very logical. I did not commit a murderous action. Shimon, rather, um, stuck his head out and caused himself to be Macabal to receive, be on the receiving end of that axe. Again, hey, we'll Rabbi, elaborate on all these me. things. Uh, if I can just get through the Mishnah, we'll elaborate on all these things in the Gemara. I'll pause after the Mishnah just to take any questions, but let's get through this. Zarag is a Evan Lechetzro, Baharag. If somebody throws a stone, now not into a public domain, not into the Beldani's parking lot, but <laughs> you threw it into somebody's backyard. You threw it into a courtyard. In Yesh Rishus Lenizik Lichanes Lasham Gula. So if the victim was allowed to be there, he was allowed to be in my backyard, that in that backyard at the time, then I'm held accountable, just like any case of accidentally killing someone. The Imalav Eno Gola. But if he had no business being in that backyard to begin with, he wasn't invited to be there. He, uh, I don't know, he was there stealing somebody's bike or he just happened to be walking through and trying to use it as a shortcut to, uh, to get to somewhere. Uh, so then in that case, the mazik, the person who threw the ax, who threw the stone, is not culpable. He's not guilty because the nizik, the victim, had no business being there to begin with. Um, and that's not called victim blaming either, apparently. So Shinemar, as and we derive this from the verse, Bashir Yavo Esrehu Bayar, that he and his friend, it's talking about the case, uh, the classic case of killing Bashogeg, that Shimon, Ruben and Shimon go down to the forest together. So the paradigm, paradigmatic case of the Torah of the forest, a forest is public property. Both Rubin and Shimon are allowed to be there. So anywhere where both the uh, killer and the victim are allowed to be there, that is where a case of killing Meshogeg and thereby being sent into exile can take place. Whereas to the exclusion of a chatzer, of the owner, where the nizik, the victim, had no reason being there. If he had no business being there, he was not permitted to be there, then, you know, obviously we, we would hope that it wouldn't have to lead to it, but it's his problem. He shouldn't have been there to begin with. Had he not been trespassing, he would not have been killed. Uh, so that is the important exclusion that we learn from the verse. Now, just one more idea, let's just get to the end of the Mishnah. Lots of important principles in here. Another important principle that we derive from the paradigmatic case, from the paradigm in the Torah of going into Gullahs, of killing the Shogeg, chopping down wood as a lumberjack is a Dvar Rishos. Remember, um, was it last month? It could have been last Monday night, but two Monday nights ago, we talked about whether eating matzah over Pesach other than the first night. We asked, is it a mitzvah or is it a rishus? 
Remember, so we talked about a Rishos. A Rishos is something that I don't have to do. A Rishos is something I'm allowed to do, but I don't have to do. So going down to the forest to chop wood is something I can choose to do, but I don't have to go down to a forest and chop wood. That's, uh, that's up to me to decide. Um, so any the case of where the killer, where Ruve will be held accountable for killing Shimon accidentally, inadvertently, is where Ruve and Shimon were there by their own volition. They didn't have to be there. Yotza avamakis benov, aravarodas tanino v'shiach basin. However, a father who is disciplining his child, or a teacher who's disciplining his student, or a shliach based in a uh, the the guy who gives like, who gives the whips and based in, they and he accidentally kills the person in the process, since they are performing a dvar mitzvah, since they are performing um, something they are obligated to do by God. They actually, if they inadvertently kill someone in the process, they are not sent into Gullus because that does not fit the paradigm of the Torah, which is lumberjacks in a forest, which is a voluntary deed, a voluntary activity. Ad Khan, the Mishnah, that brings us to the end of the Mishnah. Let me pause here. Do we have, I mean, a lot of the questions we have might be addressed by the Gemara, but let me pause just to take what your questions are, and I'll let you know if it's addressed in there. I don't understand something, Rabbi. If 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 you go into a public place and you throw a stone or you shoot a bullet or an arrow, I mean it's a public domain. What right do you have to do that kind of a thing? You have to assume if you're in a public domain that somebody might show up, even uh, if you didn't see them. So Frector and Phyllis Akasha, the first Kasha of the Kamara. Very good. Phyllis, you are you are on you're on the ball. This is perfect. That's exactly the first question that we will ask that the Gemara will ask. So you you and the Amaraim know exactly what to ask on this mission. I see a greater complexity that, that, than just that question, because there are certain dangerous activities which you are allowed to engage in in a public place. Uh, for example, operating a motor vehicle on a public road or we're talking about being in the woods or an open field public land uh, or private land that you're on by consent of the owner and you're hunting with bow and arrow, with a rifle, with a handgun. Uh, you see a deer, you take aim, you yeah. don't see anybody in the area, you shoot. Meanwhile, somebody is coming in at, from outside your view and they get hit or the bullet goes <laughs> deeper into the woods where you can't see the person and it hits them. Mm -hmm. you, you there's a way to alert you haven't been negligent you can you can alert you can make sure that there's nobody around there were ways in which you could do that you you not you, totally, you, not totally. You, you play a bull you know a horn or something or you do something i mean then the so, animal's going to run away well okay so then go to another place <laughs> shoot and yeah, they got the same situation in another place <laughs> well i i think there yes there was some like operating a motor, a, a car. Yeah, you have to assume that you know how to drive and that you can do this, and that and somebody steps off the curb in front of you. Well, okay, so that's why we have negligence lawyers for that kind of thing. <laughs> that's why we got Toby Schieffer and Jenny. Yeah, okay. Here we go. A negligence lawyer would make money for. on that one. <laughs> right, uh, Jenny, you look like you were waiting patiently yeah. here with your hand up. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I guess the difference that I would see from a public policy perspective of why it should be different for someone who gets hurt in a public domain versus someone who gets hurt in a private domain has to be based on one's own, how do I say this, uh, based on like, if you are putting yourself out in a public place, um, you uh you kind of have like less protection than if you're keeping yourself in a private, like you have a greater sense that someone isn't going to like throw a stone into your property. You can reasonably expect that kind of like right of quietude. Whereas if you go out into a public place, like you, you should have your wits about you. Other people owe you less duty, basically, I would think in a public place. So I would also, I was taking the counterpoint to what uh, to what Phyllis was saying. And I'm not looking at the 
at the Gamara tonight. So I don't know if that's like <laughs> correct or if I'm totally wrong, but well, that's, that would be my guess. To a certain, to a certain degree, you know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. To a certain degree, though, it, the distinction, the main distinction we should keep in mind is that in a public domain, the person who throws the stone, the onus is on him to be careful. And whereas in a private domain, so again, if the victim was allowed to be there, then it's the same as a public domain. You have to be careful. But if someone's trespassing in my backyard, I'm allowed to chuck as many stones in my backyard as I want. I'm allowed to, right? If I want to do knife throwing or axe throwing in my backyard, the, my, yeah. my future hobby when eventually Marissa and I get a house sometime down the line and we have a backyard, I have room for it, right? So if you were not invited into the backyard, I mean, hopefully I'll be able to invite all of you one day, God willing. But meanwhile, during uh, this time, no one's allowed to be in the backyard, then you weren't supposed to be there. It's on you for being there. Well, in this country, or at least in this state, that's not always necessarily the case. Ah. And it's, it, you know, for example, let's say if, if, if you have any knowledge that people on occasion do trespass on your property, then that gives you a higher level of responsibility. You mean like a fence around a pool? Like a fence around a pool, like Ooh. a hole, like a hole in your, in your yard that nobody would expect to be there. Um, I remember the attractive nuisance doctrine. Right. Yeah. Well, that's that's for kids. That's for kids. Oh. But even for adults, um, you, if if you have reason to believe or if, if that people might trespass on your property, there is some level of responsibility that you have. Very, very mm -hmm. fascinating. Now, there mm -hmm. this does come up in the Gemara as well. The Gemara does say that if enough people, if you allow people to pass through your yard, it's not just of allowing, but even if you just have knowledge that it happens. That's, that's interesting. I don't think halacha would actually go that far. Um, I think halacha might be a little bit more protective of our property than the state of Connecticut. Yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> uh, Judd, Ju did you have your hand raised? Yeah, I, I have a, a general question. You, you may have addressed this before, but logistically, how are things determined as to whether it's a private domain or a public domain in terms of the logistics of what happens with the goel adam. How is it prevented? From, uh, is the goel adam prevented, or what? How, how did that transpire? So there are designated cities of refuge. Uh, I'm forgetting the exact number, but it's over 40 cities of refuge that are designated. So, so long as the killer who killed inadvertently remains behind the walls, remains within the general vicinity of that city, he is legally protected from being killed by the Gole Hadam, from the Avengers of, not, not the superheroes, but, but the Avengers no, I, I meant, of I meant, the- I meant, uh, I meant, I meant uh, something different. I, I meant, how is it determined yeah. that he's, isn't there a sort of like a little mini court case to determine that it wasn't a public domain? So oh, I see what you mean. So the interesting thing it's, is- this, you know, this, what, this, there's a time interval where things can happen outside right. of control of the court. So, oh, you're saying what happens to him in the meantime before the whole court case goes down? So what happens is, is that the person, I think, we're going to talk about this later, I think in the third parrot, perhaps, or maybe even earlier, I'm forgetting myself. But basically, you go to Gullus preemptively. You go to the city of mm -hmm. refuge immediately. Then when the court is set up, they escort you from the city. So you're kind of like on bail, so to speak, but you're in the city, so you're not exactly on bail. And they bring you to the court. And they actually, they have Torah scholars. Um, it's interesting, they send Torah scholars with you to escort you. Uh, I guess they're hoping like, oh, they won't want to kill the rabbis also. Um, but, you know, depends how, how fondly they think about rabbis. Uh, you know, people have different opinions about people in my profession. Um, maybe it's a, it's a detriment. And then after the court case, it was determined that he actually killed Bashogig and is liable to go to exile. They escort him back. And that's that's essentially what happens. So oh, well, Rabbi, he said, I, I, forgive me because I've missed a class or two. So it, I, although you covered so much territory, I'm thinking I missed like a month, but I don't think so. Um, so so may, forgive me if this is something you've already discussed, but the language here about being exempt from exile. Do, do they want to be exempt from exile? I mean, it's protective. Okay. So wouldn't they rather be going to exile? Because 
they're going to be, there's still going to be an ang angry family out there. Okay, so yeah. the way it works is as follows. When we say someone is exempt from going to exile, it could be for a good reason or a bad reason. It could be either it didn't meet the threshold of um, negligence on his part, that he would be accountable for inadvertently killing someone, and therefore the goal of Adam would not be allowed to kill him. Um, or if someone is exempt well, from that, himself, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you're so, so how, do we, how do we protect him from the goalie Hadam? Like if they don't care about yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, that I don't know about. I know about the legal protections. I guess he has to hire bodyguards then. Mm -hmm. I All mean, right. if you know that the goalie Hadam are going to try killing him um, extra extrajudicially, then I imagine based on informs the town guard and they, they stop him. Um, they inform the, the police or whatever the equivalent is. But we're assuming people are law abiding, which I guess not always a good assumption, but that is how we're operating. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a little bit of a uh, ground. Uh, I have a question. Yes. The person we'll and then we'll move forward. is uh, have to leave the community, go to another one. What happens if he's married, has he's family? Yeah. He, in other words, will he be able to work in that other community? Ah, okay, so support. You know, it's, it's more it's yeah, like, yeah, nowadays people it's, work remotely. We have Zoom. It's possible to do that. The Gemara will talk about. I think later toward the end of the chapter. Let's say he was in a position of authority. He had a governmental position, a hush of a position in his uh, former life. Can he return back to his position of glory afterwards? So we'll talk about that. All great questions. We will address them hopefully. But let's move on to the Gemara. We have grounds. The Rosh Hashanah Ben Mezidhi. This is Phyllis's question that uh, got us down the rabbit hole. Phyllis asks as follows: Wait a minute. When I just chuck a rock into the uh, into the Beldadi's parking lot and hit somebody, I not I should not only just go to Gullahs to exile. It should be worse. That's all, that's basically like a deliberate murder. I know people are there, and I'm throwing a rock in there, knowing it's going to cause damage. Why am I not held accountable? It's a, it's a case of where, not where I was throwing rocks at people maliciously, but I was, um, uh, what do you call it? I was taking down a wall. I was doing demolition work. Yeah. Okay, great. You're doing uh, demolition work. You still need to be careful. No, I was doing demolition during the nighttime. I believe not even It doesn't matter what hour you're doing at. You still need to be careful. Maybe some people at nighttime are still walking by. No, I'm talking talking about a case where I wasn't doing it to Beldadi's parking lot, but rather it was right next to an Ashba, a garbage area where people will, uh, will relieve themselves. I uh, hi Ashba. What kind of uh, bathroom slash garbage dump are we talking about? If there's many people that use this place, Hoshehu, he's negligent. Honestly, if this is a place that no one frequents at all, then he is on us. It's, uh, he, it's not something he could have foreseen. So he, threw, he was um, throwing a rock or he was demolishing his wall into an ashba, into this garbage area where people do not use at night. Sorry, people use at night, but they don't use during the daytime. However, be good to make the yasid. There are a few people every now and then during the daytime who will use this area. So he can't be called negligent because it's not designated for daytime use. But Ones Nami Lohavi, you can't call him an onus either to Ika de because every now and then people come. So the Gemara has to explain is where it's an area that is not designated for people to walk through. But he should have been a little bit more careful because every now and then there's that random Joe who walks through. So he should have been careful about that. Therefore, it's not bad enough that it's deliberate. It's not amazing. But it's also not honest. It's not like it's I could never have foreseen it happening. So therefore, it's called the show gig. It's inadvertent, but he could have actually taken more precautions. Rabbi Lesbian Yaakov Omer. Moving on to the next part of the Mishnah. Uh, well, Quote from the Mishnah, moving forward in Gemara. Tan Rabbanan, we learn a Braisa. Umatza Pralamamsi sounds, remember my case, I'm doing the, the throwing axes and the throwing knives. 
And then Shimon sticks out and says, like, oh, my golly, what are you doing here? Jeez. And then it just slices off his, slices off his head. So, umatza pratla mamsi is atma. Where do we learn the Pasuk? That if I throw something and then someone sticks out their head uh, and it gets hit by it, that I'm not liable at all? Because it says in the Pasuk, umatza, and it is found. Prat the mamsi is atmo to the exclusion of someone who's mamsi is atmo who causes himself to be found, you know, to be found is a loose term by the head of the axe. He can Omar Rabbi Lezben Yaakov, Mishiyatza Evan the other Hotzi Halas Rosh of Gila Potter. Therefore, based on this principle, Rabbi Lezben Yaakov taught that if I throw an I throw an axe, I throw a rock, and then after the release. It was a clear path, wasn't going to hit anybody, and then someone sticks out their head. That's not my problem. He caused himself to get hit by the axe. All right? So, Lamemra, but now the Gemara is going to ask a question based on the wording, right? We're trying to say, it says in the Pasuk, uh, let me see if I can find it on the side over here. Matzah uh, is, just want to quote it actually. The ish kiloya logel vesiga yado matzah kide. Oh, where is it? Okay, matzah esreehu. Right, the metal axe, uh, the metal head of the axe, dis, um, dislodges and then buries itself into Shimon's head. So it uses the term matzah esreehu. The axe head finds Shimon. So matzah implies that it was something. We are inferring that the word matzah means something that was pre-existent, something that was always there. And therefore, we're learning if Shimon then adds himself into the equation later, that's not my problem because Shimon wasn't there at the time that I threw it. What sounded more. Uh, sorry, let me, let me just finish this. Or Minhi, but we have a contradiction. Umatza prat the matzoi. Uh, so, a very quick background. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, well, not Moshe Rabbeinu, but I guess Moshe Rabbeinu served, and then Yoshua, when they conquered Eretz Yisrael. The different families were given different ancestral pieces of land, and uh, the Torah would like them to keep it. Every uh, 49 years, at the end of 49th year, at Yovel year, the, uh, at a Jubilee year, land returns to the original families regardless of sales. Now, if I am down on my luck, I do not have the money. I, am, uh, I don't have the money to survive. I sell my ancestral field in order to make money to liquidate it. And then later on, I win, you know, I score the jackpot. I win lots of money. And now I want to buy back the field. I am able to force the original buyer after two years to sell me back my ancestral field now that I have more money. However, if I had the funds to keep the field originally, but I just wanted to sell it to make more money to uh, invest in GameStop or invest in something else on the stock market, and I didn't have to sell it, then too bad the buyer isn't going to be forced to sell it back to me. Now, what's the, how do we learn this from the verse? Umatza prat la matzoi. Matza there means, and later on, he found money. Matzah there implies not something that was found already, but something that was found later on, at a later point. Shalayim kor barachov v'yigol bekarov, meaning you shouldn't try selling a land further away and then get back your field. Barav v'yigol b'yafe, and then selling a worse field at a later point in order to get back your ancestral field that you consider and you deem nicer. So the contradiction here is that we think matzah and arpasik means that something was already there. It's the exclusion of when Shimon then puts his head in front of the axe. But we have the opposite interpretation of the word matzah when it comes to the laws of ancestral uh, land. There we say matzah prat la matzoi. Matzah means he found money later on to buy back the land to the exclusion of if he had money already to afford keeping the land, he can't force his way to buy it back. So I got an easy answer for you. Matzah doesn't have an intrinsic meaning of uh, already pre-existent or found later on. 
Rather, you have to look at it in its broader context of the Pasuk. Uh, you look in the verse talking about ancestral land, it says, Vesiga Yado, and he will obtain, he'll obtain more money. Okay, over there, obtain more money means he obtained in the future, later on. So matzah there means he found later on. Hacha, but in our case of Galus, just as a forest is something that was there already. We assume the word matzah there also means something that was pre-existent. Okay, if we didn't get all the particular uh, grammar and words, that's okay. The essential point that we need to come out with is that the word matzah in the Pasuk means, I am only liable, I am only liable if I hit something that was there at the time that I did the deed. But if I did my deed and Shimon was not there, and then Shimon adds himself into the equation later and sticks his head right in front of the, way, the trajectory of the ax, that's not my problem. That's Shimon's problem at that point. So okay. What difference does it make if it's a private domain or a public domain? Um, so the difference is that if all this happened in a private domain where Shimon was not invited and Shimon was trespassing, um, <laughs> even if Shimon what happened to have been uh, been present and I, you know, inadvertently killed him based on the criteria that we've outlined, I would not actually be liable. So again, I chuck a stone into my backyard and, oh, whoopsie daisy, Shimon's there. I'm not expected to have accounted for Shimon being there because, frankly, Shimon was not supposed to be there. Okay. I don't a little, see a little the bit difference. more flexible than Connecticut law. I don't see the difference, but anyway. What's the... What, what do you mean? I, don't see the difference. I, I don't see the difference. I mean, as far as the, in the first in the first instance, it, it, he wasn't there. His head wasn't there, and it all of a sudden appeared. The difference, so. the difference in that case is in that case we're talking about a public domain, where yeah. or a private domain where Shimon was allowed to be there, and re, by all rights I should be chai. But it's another exception to the rule where if I threw something and Shimon was not in the trajectory then puts himself in the path of the axe, then I am accountable. So those are two different qualifications. I think what you're telling us is that if Shimon is in my backyard, I don't owe an obligation to be looking around to see if there's somebody who's there that doesn't belong there. Yeah. But in a public space, I have an obligation to know who's where. Yep, I, and I not just know who, who, who's where, but basically, I have to assume that there's going to be somebody there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, like what you're saying. Okay, we have about 15 minutes left. I want to try just in the next 10 minutes to finish the Gemara that we have allotted for today. And in the last five minutes, share some interesting additional ideas that, uh, that I looked up. So uh, just buckle up. I'll pause at the end of the Gemara. I'll take the final questions that we have. And then we'll conclude with some uh, additional ideas from the Rishonim on the Gemara. So we inferred that if someone is doing a dvar mitzvah, if someone is performing a mitzvah, bless you, someone's performing a mitzvah and they inadvertently kill someone, they are not held accountable. Why? Because the case, the paradigm of the Torah is a case where I'm performing a voluntary activity of chopping wood in the forest. The Gemara asks, who says it's a voluntary activity the Torah is talking about? Maybe I'm chopping wood to build a sukkah. Maybe I'm chopping wood so it could be put in the maracha, so it could be used to burn karbonos, to burn sacrifices in the temple. And the Torah says, even though I'm performing a mitzvah, I still have to go to Gullus. I still have to go into exile. So how are we inferring from the Torah that we're necessarily talking about a case of rishos as opposed to mitzvah? Chov. Amar That's not a good question. Why? The answer is, is that chopping wood for a sukkah is not a mitzvah. You see, there's something called a mitzvah and a heksher mitzvah. 
This deserves its own separate class and many classes actually. A mitzvah is something that I'm intrinsically obligated to do. A heksher mitzvah is a means to performing a mitzvah. What's the mitzvah? The mitzvah is to sit in a sukkah, arguably maybe even to build a sukkah somewhat, but there's no mitzvah to chop wood to then bring it to build a sukkah. So it's an important thing to do, but it's a means to an end. It's not intrinsically a mitzvah. Also chopping wood for it to burn on the mitzvah, they might already have wood. You know, the chopping the wood is not the mitzvah, it's a means to an end. It's important not to confuse the goal with the means to getting to that goal. So even if it is a case of chopping wood for a sukkah in the Torah, that's still not a mitzvah. Isvei Rabbi Rava, but Rabina asked Rava, um, so then the Rabbina asks Rava, but wait a minute, the case of a Dvar Mitzvah in our Mishnah, of someone performing a Mitzvah, uh, let's say a, rab, a teacher right back in the olden days. This is, by the way, we're going to talk about this um, in a future Monday class. I have it docketed, God willing. We're going to talk about discipline in schools and uh, whether corporal punishment is permissible in halakha, how post in the 20th century and 21st century have addressed um, the natural uncomfortableness with corporal punishment. But so we're going to learn the abstract now. We'll talk about the practical implications in a future Monday night class, God willing. So the question is, is same idea over here. Maybe if the student already learned his lesson and the uh, child already learned his lesson, there's no intrinsic mitzvah for me to discipline my child. It's only to get, you know, my job is for them to do mitzvahs, to be observant, to raise them properly. If they are a good kid, they don't need any discipline. So maybe disciplining also is not intrinsically a mitzvah. It's just a means to getting them to performing mitzvahs. So the answer is no. Awesome. Huge finish over here. Awesome. I thought I got to go here. Mitzvah. Even if the kid already learned his lesson, it's a mitzvah to give him another whack. Why? As it says, uh, I think it's in uh, Mishlei, if I'm not mistaken, that if you discipline your child, he'll provide respite for you, and he'll also provide delights for your soul. So, you know, Is wow. that the halacha? That's the halacha. Oh, come on. <laughs> now, now, Toby, again, I said, we're going to do a Monday night class where I will explain that there are certain qualifications to this. So, uh, but certainly without any commentaries or post skim, the way it's right now, um, I was hoping for, for a response like that. So I appreciate it. <laughs> You're so welcome. <laughs> so, so there you go. There, there's, so that's the trailer. That's the, um, the trailer for the Monday night class that will come up eventually. You know what? Maybe we'll do it this Monday night, actually. Why not? Maybe we'll do it this Monday night just so it's uh, connected to the topic. I don't want to leave everyone in suspense for a month. Okay, moving forward, Rava has another answer to the question. Remember the question was, maybe the Torah is talking about a case of chopping wood for the Mizbeach or chopping wood uh, to build a sukkah. So maybe even if you're doing a mitzvah, you still go to Gullis if you inadvertently kill someone in the process. Rava says, I got a better answer. What's the word Ba'asher mean? That somebody and his friend will happen to go into the forest. Asher implies Mayar Diboy Isle Diboy Lo Isle. A forest going there is voluntary. The implication of the word Asher is, you know, again, you have to know Hebrew well, but apparently a share implies that what's happening is voluntary. What's happening is being done by someone's volition. They don't have to be there. A share, I happen to have come there. I happen to have come down to the forest. If I, there was a mitzvah to come down to the forest, um, it wouldn't have used the word a share. I happen Isn't that the word that's used like in, in brachos, like a share kiddushanu b'mitzvah sub? That doesn't sound... Yeah, so I mean, when like, a chazal, when a chazal, I think it's more like biblical Hebrew as opposed to a chazal creating brachos. But that's a good point. Asher Shanu, well, that God just happened to have commanded me. That's a good call. Yeah. That's a good point. But that's apparently how they understand it, at least in biblical Hebrew, not in uh, Talmudic Hebrew or uh, Mishnaic Hebrew, Mishnaic Hebrew. 
but uh, we'll have to ask Hebrew experts. Anyway, that's what the Gemara assumes. Wherever it says word asher, um, it's voluntary. That's what you're assuming. It says in the Torah, and now those who are with uh, with us for uh, Mishnayas Pesachim, you'll remember this very well. Those who are in the daily Pesachim Mishnayas, we got a few here. That if you go to the base of Mikdash, you go to the temple and you are spiritually impure, you are Tameh, then you get Kares, you get divine excision, you incur a punishment. Um, the implication, but it says Asher in that Pasuk, Ibai Mitma, Ibai Lo Mitma. That implies that I had a choice whether to do something that would cause me to become Tameh. But the But the implication is that if I was forced to become tame, such as a mace mitzvah, I saw someone, uh, a corpse along the path, and I am obligated to bury it. I had no choice whether to become tame or not, but I had to become tame nonetheless. And the halacha is that I'm still not allowed to go into the base of Mikdash. But according to you, Rava who is telling you that the word asher implies voluntary, implies I'm not forced to do something, it's not compulsory, then if I'm forced to become Tameh, uh, this, this prohibition of me entering the temple precincts should not be effective on me if I was forced to become Tameh, if you understand asher to be voluntary. Only people who came voluntarily Tameh should not be allowed to go in. So then why is a mace mitzah, someone who had to become Tameh, is not allowed to go into the temple? So Rav responds, Shani Hasam Damar Kura, Tameh Yia Mikol Makum, because it says in the verse, Tameh Yihi Ya, which implies, it, it basically, if I only had the word Asher, I would think only those who became voluntarily Tameh were included, but it has the words Tameh Yihi Ya, which imply that it doesn't matter whether it was voluntary, it doesn't matter what, what your choice was, it doesn't matter what your intentions were, if you are tame as a statement of fact, you're not allowed to go into the base of Mikdash, you're not allowed to go into the temple. Ay, hahumi look at Tanya, but we need the pos- we need the words tameiya, the extra words tameiya to teach me, look at Tanya, as we taught in a brisa, tameiya, the rabbis tavol yom, tameiya, those words are used to exclude something else. So you're not, you're used to exclude something. To exclude someone who went to mikvah, but did not wait, he was Tameh, he went to mikvah, he immersed himself in the mikvah, but he did not wait until the end of the day. He did not wait until it got dark. You have to wait until it gets dark to go into the base of mikdash. You're not fully pure yet. And the words, to Masobo, the Ramos Mechusar Kippurim. And it just happens to quote the rest of the Brisa that the words, to Masobo, tell us someone who did not yet bring karbanos, if someone was tame and he was obligated to bring a sacrifice, he didn't bring it yet, also he's not allowed to go um, into the precincts of the Beis HaMikdash yet. Amar le, I derive that teaching from od tumaso, and yeah. therefore I can use the word tamayihiya to tell me that in the case of tuma, someone who's tame, even if you were obligated to become tame. You're still not allowed to go into the base of Mikdash, but assuming I don't have any additional terms implying otherwise, Asher, the word Asher conveys a voluntary nature. And since it contain, it conveys a voluntary nature, we assume that the word Asher is only when someone is involved in a voluntary activity, but someone's involved in a mitzvah, an obligatory activity, and they accidentally kill someone, they will not be sent to Gullus for killing the Shogi. Now I know some of the wor- some of the derivations from the words back and forth is a little unclear, but that is the essential point that we need to understand to um, move forward in the Gemara. That brings us to the top of the Ches Amebeis of AP, and we will conclude with that piece of Gemara. What I want to do over the next four minutes is pause for any essential questions, and then share one brief piece from the Rishonim on the Gemara. Are there any essential questions, anything I could clarify, just to make sure we understand basic shot in the Gemara? Mm. Okay. So, because I prepared something, I, I don't want to keep it us over time, so I just wanted to share what I have here, 
Um, few interesting things. So we didn't really elaborate on this, but remember we talked about it at the end of the Mishnah, one of the things that someone could do that's considered a mitzvah that will um, absolve them from going into Gullus is a shliat bastin, the guy who, you know, he gives the makos, who gives the lashes. If he hits it, the guy and he kills him, he does not have to go into Gullus. So there's two understandings of what happens in that case. One understanding is he lost track of the count, right? We're doing sphere right now. We can lose track of count all the time. So he overhit somebody one more than he should have given him. That's the approach in the Ravid. But the main consensus, the main approach is that actually he was told the guy can handle 39 lashes. He gave him all 39 lashes, but it turned out the guy couldn't handle it. So there actually, the Ramon says that the Pator, the exemption is not because the Shliat Basin is involved in a mitzvah, because one could say Tosos brings up this idea, but rejects it, that um, giving someone Malkus is also not intrinsically a mitzvah. Rather, what you know, if someone never committed a sin, we would never have to give them Malkus. So maybe giving giving Malkus is not intrinsically a mitzvah. So what's the bator? Why is the shliach basin? Why is the, the guy giving the lashes exempt? Because anusu. The Ramban says he's an anus because, look, the experts told him this guy can handle 39 lashes. I'm just following what the doctor said. If they got it wrong, that's not my fault. I trusted the experts. So therefore, it's not that it, he's involved in a mitzvah, but he's an anus. He's exempt because he followed the experts. The experts are wrong. That's not his fault. That's one idea I want to share from Rishonim. The one other thing I want to share in our last uh, minute and a half is that there's a Tosefta, again, a very early rabbinic source that says that a doctor, I, I'm so sad, I'm, I'm, I'm squishing this into the last minute. There's so much to say here. The do a doctor who accidentally kills someone in the process of performing a uh, medical procedure, they, are, they actually do go to Gullus. And the question that everyone asks is, wait a minute, healing somebody, shouldn't that be a mitzvah? You're saving another person's life. If a doctor is involved in a mitzvah saving someone's life, why do they go to Gullus then? Good question, right? So very Could briefly. Have been a better doctor. All right, get a better doctor. So, right, if it was malpractice, so one opinion is, according to Aruch HaShulchan, uh, look, you know, if the guy was doing malpractice, if he could have been more um, meticulous, but he was misrashil. He was just lazy that day. He didn't take all the measures that he could have to save and preserve someone's life. Then, okay, so that's why it's malpractice. He goes to Gullus. So that's what the Tosef is talking about. But a very fascinating idea in the Gilyone Hashas, the Gilyone Hashas says um, that actually, why is the mitzvah of healing somebody, or rather, why is healing somebody not considered a mitzvah, an intrinsic mitzvah? Because if someone had because if I had enough faith in a Kaddish Baruch, if I had enough faith in God, I wouldn't need the doctor to heal me. Uh, so, of course, it's a good thing for doctors to heal people, but it's not considered a mitzvah because if I had enough betachon in Hashem, enough faith in God, I wouldn't need the doctor to heal me, which um, I'm just putting it out there. I'm not necessarily supporting that notion. Then but, how come doctors get heterim to be Mechal HaShabbos? Um, so the Mechal HaShabbos, I mean, well, what, right, right. Because mo So we assume most people don't have that level of bitachon, apparently, according to this shot. Um, mm. I, I personally, you know, it's a Galeone HaShas who might disagree. I'm not personally compelled by that, but I thought it was a little bit of a, an amusing idea. So I thought I would share it just for our uh, learning purposes. Anyway, um, this brings so this just brings us to the end. It's nine oh one. I realize so. Anyone who needs to go, thank you so much for coming. I should call. Have a good shot. Thank you, thank you, and have thank a wonderful you. yontif. See you over Shabbos and yontif, God willing, either in the tent or in the chapel, wherever we may see you. I'll stay on for a few more minutes just to address any yeah. remaining questions. Yontif to everybody. Thank you so much. Hug Sameach, everyone. Hug Sameach. Good Shabbos. Shabbos. Uh, Zidi, you had a question. Yes. Uh, a road day comes to kill me. I, is it a mess for me to rise up and kill him first or to kill a road day to protect somebody else's life? 
Uh, yes. Oh, so you're saying is, why is that any different? So interesting, interesting point, right? That's the question, right? Why should I be any different than a doctor? So it depends, you know, I'll, I'll answer this off the cuff. It depends on your understanding of how Hashkacha Pratis works. You see, when you read the art scroll books about Hashkacha Pratis, about how divine providence works, they assume that nothing happens to you unless Hashem ordains it. But according to summary shown him, um, part of having free will is that people can do things even if God does not ordain it to be so. God gives us free will. So if Ruvain wants to kill Shimon, even if Shimon was not um, declared by God on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur for him to die that year, if according to a minority opinion of medieval philosophers, if Ruvain wants to go ahead and kill Shimon, he could succeed in doing it unless Shimon has um, an abundant amount of merit to protect him from doing that. So I would say, according to that shot, uh, maybe in a case of a rofe where I'm dying from a sickness, all I need is faith in a Kaddish Baruch Hu to save me. But in a case of a rode, maybe um, there needs to actually be action taken because maybe faith would not be enough, even according to some of those opinions. Again, just conjecture. Um, I think it's a difficult position to begin with. So I don't. I, I personally am not compelled by that shot. But since you asked based on that shot, I thought I'd give you some form of an answer to something I don't think is compelling to begin with. Well, okay. Does that address the point somewhat? Well, you know, this is very interesting because um, in New York City, Manhattan, there are a lot of construction mm -hmm. going on. And Mel always told me, stay clear from it. Don't be on the near it. Things can fall. You understand? And even though, you know, they have, you can walk under it, don't. So I try to skirt all these places where there's construction because you never know. If someone could be flying a half a block away. That's a piece good. of good advice, you know, and you can see it's it's rooted in the not in the Gemara as well. So you have his architectural knowledge, you have the Gemara's points over here, it all connects. Okay, wonderful. And, and so, I'll tell you something. Uh Mel had to go on a lot of there was a lot of project he was with, involved in in right. Manhattan. This, this was I his expertise. Never go, even though the building is completed, he never permitted me. Oh, he said wow. Rats, they oh. haven't fumigated. Now no, you my, see, my, my rule is I'm just telling you. My so rule is I avoid New York City in general. So I avoid the, all those problems. Stay away from these things. Stay away from New York City. Thank you so much. All <laughs> right, good. have a good show. It's good, you too, uh, yes, have a good day. Thank you. thank you again for learning together. It's good to be back. Thank you. Thank you very much.